Hello and welcome to the channel. Uh, today we're continuing our series on the Expressway servers. Now this time we're going to start digging a bit deeper in the configuration menu. Now just to remind you, configuration is where most engineers spend their time on a VCS or Expressway and the primary function of these menu items uh, is for configuring the server to manage your video network. So all of these settings affect how your endpoints register, uh, how your calls are routed, etc. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on protocols today. Now, the Expressway servers can support both H.323 and SIP, but because H.323 and SIP cannot natively talk to each other, you have to have a gateway in between them uh, that can translate between the two protocols. We call that gateway the interworking gateway, which we have here. So first, let's look at our H.323 settings. First, notice that H.323 uh, is on, but by default, it's set to off. So you have to come in and manually enable it if you want to use H.323 services on this server. Now this registration port is the port that H.323 uses. Uh, this is the UDP port uh, 1719. But if you're doing call setup, H.323 uses the TCP port uh, 1720. So these are the default ports and uh, you're not really going to change those. Now this setting here, registration conflict mode, Okay, so if an endpoint is registered using H.323 to this server, to this expressway, and another H.323 endpoint tries to register with the same alias information, how does the expressway treat that second registration attempt? Because you can't have two endpoints registered with the same alias information. So if this is set to reject, which is the default setting, then the second endpoint will get rejected when it tries to register. But if you change this to overwrite, then when that second endpoint tries to register, the first endpoint will become unregistered. And the reason overwrite exists is because a lot of companies use DHCP for IP addressing of their endpoints. And if an endpoint reboots or shuts down for a period of time and turns back on, what happens sometimes is their IP address changes and the way an expressway identifies an endpoint's registration is by their IP address. So if an IP address changes but their alias is the same, this expressway is going to see that incoming registration as a different endpoint. And it holds, by the way, it holds on to the old registration for a set amount of time, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And if that hold registration is still in there when the endpoint tries to register with a new IP address, it'll see it as uh, two different endpoints trying to register with the same information, even though it's actually the same endpoint. So you can change this setting to overwrite, which will allow the expressway to drop the old registration and allow the new one to come in. Now the danger in that is that if a legitimately different endpoint is trying to register with the same alias information with overwrite set, then this server will kick out the first endpoint and allow the second one to register. But if the first endpoint is a legitimately different endpoint, then uh, it'll, it'll then try to re-register again, in which case the second one will get kicked out. But then the second one will try to re-register and the endpoints will just uh, kind of keep fighting back and forth, which means that calls are going to fail, uh, it'll create a lot of routing behavior issues and so forth. So what Cisco recommends is that anything that's registering to a VCS or Expressway, you should set the IP addresses on the endpoints statically. Don't use DHCP. And then set the registration conflict mode to reject. That's why it's the default. Okay? Now earlier I mentioned that you can shut down an endpoint, uh, but the server still holds on to that registration. Now that has to do with this time to live setting here. So time to live is how long an endpoint's registration will remain in the server before the endpoint is required to re-register. So this is in seconds and uh, the default is 1800, so I guess that's uh, 30 minutes, which means that uh, once an endpoint is registered, the registration will remain for 30 minutes. So let's talk about this other setting here, uh, call time to live. Now when an endpoint places a call to another endpoint, the call setup goes through the VCS or Expressway C, but the media is direct between the endpoints, right? This is just like on a CCM. But when the call is torn down at the end, the call disconnect messages have to go through the VCS or Expressway so that it knows when the call is torn down. Otherwise, it'll think the call is still active. But what happens if two endpoints are in a call and, for example, maybe you lose power to the endpoint uh, or maybe the network goes down or whatever? 
and all of a sudden the call drops out without going through the normal call teardown process, what happens to the call from the expressway's perspective? Of course, it thinks the call is still active. So that's why they have this call time to live option. It means that every so often, uh, in this case 120 seconds, the expressway is gonna reach out to those endpoints and say, hey, are you still in a call? Then whether it's in a call or not, the expressway can respond accordingly. Now the call time to live determines how far apart those intervals are when that message is sent out. So the default is 120. Again, this is in seconds. You can set it as low as 60 seconds or go all the way up to 65,000 and something. Uh, but the default is 120 or two minutes. Okay, so if you go down to the bottom of the page, uh, you can see the status. And as long as it's enabled and your ports are set up appropriately, you'll see active for both registration and call signaling. Okay, so now let's look at SIP settings. Uh, so we're gonna go to Configuration, Protocols, SIP. And we'll start with SIP mode. And again, this is off by default, so you'll have to turn this on uh, if you want to use SIP. Then instead of just using UDP for registration and TCP for calls, we actually have four different settings for SIP uh, that you may want to enable. The first UDP mode is for SIP registration unsecure. Now you can leave UDP mode off and turn TLS mode on if all of your registrations are gonna be secure. But if you wanna allow unsecure registration, then you have to turn UDP mode on as well. Now UDP uses port 5060 by default, and then for call setup, which is TCP, it uses uh, 5060, or for encrypted calls, uh, we use TLS, which uses uh, port 5061. TLS is the only one that's on by default. In previous versions though, uh, anything before 9.9.2, the default for SIP mode and TCP mode are gonna be set to on. So just keep that in mind if you're using an older version. Okay, then you also have something called mutual TLS. Now this is when you add certificates to both the client and the server, and then they have to mutually authenticate each other. It's used sometimes when you're doing a mobile remote access, MRA, or if you're doing hybrid integrations with uh, WebEx Control Hub. Now this is off by default, which is fine because we're not gonna do anything uh, with this just yet, but uh, we will get around to this eventually, okay? So those are your SIP settings. Uh, if you come down here to the bottom, uh, there's some other stuff here that we can ignore, at least for now. Uh, but down here at the bottom, you can see what's active and inactive. Now one other setting that you have to set up with SIP on an expressway is your domains uh, because SIP registrations on an expressway use host at fully qualified domain name, uh, which means that this expressway has to qualify the domain in the URIs used by endpoints. So if I go up to configuration domains, I can click new and then I can enter my domains here. Now these don't have to be publicly registered domains. If you're just using it for local routing, you could do, uh, you could do cisco.local, okay? Or even you could do uh, say peter.parker. It doesn't matter, you can call a domain uh, anything that you want. And of course they can be publicly registered domains, but they don't have to be. The important thing is that it's a fully qualified domain, meaning that this server will qualify whatever domain you put in here against the URIs, uh, SIP URIs, trying to register to the server. Okay, so if I'm registering user at whatever domain, that domain must exist in here or it won't register via SIP. Okay, so we've done H.323 and SIP so the last thing we're gonna look at under configuration protocols is interworking. Now interworking is the ability for SIP and H.323 endpoints to call each other in either direction. Now there are three settings for interworking, on, off, and registered only. So let's talk about what each one of these mean. In this network example, I have an expressway core which supports SIP and H.323 endpoint registration. I have a CUCM which supports SIP only registration. And I have a third party gatekeeper which supports only H.323 registration. The gatekeeper is neighbored to the expressway and then there's a trunk from the CUCM to the expressway as well. Okay, so with interworking set to off, I can still register both of these endpoints. The H.323 can call only H.323 and the SIP can only call SIP. 
There's no interworking between H.323 and SIP because, of course, interworking is turned off. However, if I change interworking to on, then everybody can call everybody. I still get H.323 to H.323. I get SIP to SIP, and my SIP endpoints on the expressway can be in a call with the H.323 on the expressway. The SIP endpoint can call the H.323 on the gatekeeper, and the H.323 endpoint on the expressway can call the SIP endpoint on the CUCM. So here's what's significant about this. My SIP endpoint on the CUCM can call my H.323 endpoint on the gatekeeper even though neither one is registered to the expressway. That's interworking set to on. However, if I have interworking to registered only, I lose that ability. With registered only, my endpoint on the CUCM would no longer be able to call my endpoint on the gatekeeper because neither one of them are registered to the expressway. So with registered only, one of the endpoints involved in the call must be registered to the expressway for the call to work. So my H.323 endpoint registered to the expressway can call my SIP endpoint registered to the CUCM because at least one of them is registered to the expressway. Same thing going in the other way. My SIP endpoint on the expressway can call my H.323 endpoint on the gatekeeper because the SIP endpoint is registered to the expressway. But again, my SIP endpoint on the CCM cannot call my H.323 endpoint on the gatekeeper because neither one is registered to the expressway. Now registered only is the default setting and this is what's recommended if you use mixed environments with SIP and H.323. Okay, so once you've configured all of your SIP and H.323 settings, you can start to register your endpoints. And for that, we're gonna configure a DX80. So what I think I'll do, I'll go ahead and save that for the next video so that we don't make this one too long. So stay tuned for that and uh, to see how that works and I'll see you in the next one.